Welcome to A Pearl in Every Cow's Lips here. This series was recorded here in our classroom with actual students. You just get to listen in. We are using curriculum from Christian Light Education, and this is Language Arts 7, Book 1. Language Arts 7, Lesson 6. Today we're going to talk about direct objects. Let's first of all review. Adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives modify what? Nouns. Nouns or pronouns, and they tell what? What kind of, how many, and which, who's, and which, which how many? Perfect. Which, who's, how many, and what kind of. Adverbs modify verbs. Verbs. They also modify adjectives and adverbs when they tell how, when, where, to and what extent. to what extent or to what degree. Good. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about direct objects. The direct object is something in the sentence that receives the action. So we need to have an action verb that's doing the action, and then there's something that receives the action. If you're playing soccer and you say, I kicked the ball, what receives the action of you kicking? The ball. It's flying through space now. I kicked the ball. The ball is the direct object. I helped my brother. What receives the action of being helped? My brother. The brother. My brother. My brother is the direct object. So, we're going to look at the direct object in the sentence, and this is one of my favorite sentences. It is the sentence to stick in your head to remember direct objects by. Mother baked a pie. That simple. Mother baked a pie. What's the verb in the sentence? Baked. Who or what baked? Mother. Mother. Mother baked who or what? A pie. A pie. Good. So mother baked what? A pie. Pie is the direct object. It's receiving the action of mother baking. That's what she's doing. She's baking a pie. Now, why I like this sentence is because it's a very simple. It has a verb, it has a subject, it has a direct object. To diagram it, we diagram it very quickly like this. Mother, date, direct object line, pi. A direct object line is straight. Predicate adjective or predicate nominative line is slanted. But a direct object line here is straight. Make sure you make a straight line. And it, guess what? Guess what? If you, no, it doesn't go through the line. Correct. Just one that stops. Guess what? If on your diagrams you make a line that looks kind of like this, I don't know if it's straight or slanted. I don't know if you're just being sloppy with a slanted line, if you're being sloppy with a straight line, and it can easily be marked wrong. So make your lines or straight lines, make them, for direct objects, make them good and straight. And if you need a slanted line for a predicate adjective or a predicate nominative, make that line good and slanted. I don't want there to be any questions on whether it's a straight or a slanted line. So go ahead and make those lines good and straight and good and slanted. Now, we need to talk about diagramming direct objects. And we need to talk about not just diagramming direct objects, but diagramming in general. I haven't gone over with you guys some of the simple rules for diagramming. And this is the way to diagram. Step one, two, and three to find the direct object. To diagram a sentence, we will always do this. Find the verb first. Find the verb first. What is the verb in this sentence? The pretty girl threw the flowers out the window. Through is the verb. Great. Find the verb. Now, step two. Ask who or what to find the subject. Girl. Who or what through? Girl. Good. The girl through. So this and is the subject. Verb, object and is this is the verb. Now, step three. Say the subject and verb and ask who or what to find the direct object. So they say, girl through who or what? Flower. Flowers. Excellent. Direct object, flowers. The pretty girl threw the flowers out the window. Now, let's do the next one. We sat at the table and ate potatoes for supper. Find the verb. We sat. Oh, no, the verb. Uh, Always the find the verb first. Is it first. It will be the easiest thing to find. Sat, are there any more verbs in here? Eight as well, good. Eight. Ask who or what to find the subject. Who or what sat and ate? We. We, so we is the subject. Now, say the subject and verb and ask who or what. We sat, who or what? Table. No, nothing. We ate, who or what? Potatoes. Potatoes, we ate potatoes, direct object. Potatoes. Yeah. Potatoes is the direct object for supper. Now let's diagram that. We found the subject, the verbs, and the direct object. Subject. We. We need to break it into split on a fork, put the verbs on a fork. We sat and we ate. Divide this thing. Now I want this line to go the whole way through. The line between the subject and the verb must go the whole way through. And on the dotted line we'll go and. We sat and ate. Ate who or what? Our direct object, potatoes. 
Now, what do we do with the rest of the words? We sat at the table as a prepositional phrase, and we put the prepositional and slanted line, the object down here, table, and the, under. the under, and eight potatoes. Four down, supper, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. and then supper there. Four, supper. All right, direct objects, receive the action of the verb. Not all sentences have direct objects. We could have, we sat at the table. We sat at the table. Nothing's receiving the action. But we ate the potatoes. Potatoes is receiving the action of being eaten. Okay, that covers it for the lesson. Let's now read the spelling words together and talk about them. So, turn to page 19. Easily confused pairs for spelling words. So, I'm going to read it and give a little bit of, def of a definition. We're going to go um, palette, palette. These two first words sound exactly the same if we read across. Palette and palette. The first palette means the roof of your mouth. That soft, squishy spot is your soft palate, and your hard palate is that hard spot. The roof of your mouth, it's all hard there behind your teeth. And then up in your back, even above your throat, is your soft palate and your hard palate. Um, so that's what palate means, the first palate. The second palate, with double T's, means mm, this is a palette. A palette of colors to paint with, like a paint brushing palette. Um, with double T's, you can think of those two T's as being maybe paint brushes. Um, double T's in that one, and then other than that, it's the same. The next set is effect and uff effect. <coughs> effect or effect, the effect of doing this is bad. And then affect, it, tend, it happened to affect the girl very badly. Affect carries, with an A, carries more the idea of affection, love, how it feels in your heart. Um, the next two, confidant and confident. And I'm going to say confidant so that you can easily understand. It's one of the correct ways of saying that first word with an A, confidant. And a confidant is your buddy, your pal, your confidant, your friend. He's a person that you tell all your secrets to. The next two, personnel and personal. Personnel is someone who works. So personnel, the personnel in the library are the people who are putting the books back on the shelves. And then personal has to do with you as a person. This is a personal question. The next two, emerge and submerge. Emerge means to come out of something. Submerge means to put something under the water or under something. The next two, ascent and ascent. They sound exactly the same. The first one, ascent with a C, means to climb. And then ascent just with double S's means to agree. I gave my ascent. The next two, alter and alter. The first alter with an E means to change. We decided to alter the pattern. We changed it a little bit to fit my little sister. Um, and then alter with an A means a place where you do a sacrifice. You can put the sacrifice on the altar with an A. An altar with an E means to change. Eminent and imminent. Eminent means towering, like a mountain, or something that's about to fall. There was an, uh, not about to fall so much as eminent. We saw the eminent mountain towering before us. We saw the eminent, the eminent cliff made us afraid. That means it's towering, it's huge. Eminent means it's going to happen very quickly. There was imminent danger. The danger was just seconds away. There was eminent danger, the danger was towering and huge. So danger could be eminent, towering, and imminent, about to happen, gonna happen very quickly. Illusion, illusion is like an optical illusion, something you see that isn't quite true. And then illusion is to allude to something. So that means you kind of hinted at it. So you make an illusion, that means you kind of hint at, at something else. Maybe you're saying something and you're just alluding to something that we all know about that happened earlier. Uh, maybe we would say, I don't know what to use for an illustration. Maybe someone got bit by a dog, and the next time you talk to them, you would say, you know, we should be a little careful around dogs. You might allude to what happened before. Allusion means to refer to something that happened before. And then insight and insight. Um, insight, the first one is used, usually said like this, insight, with the accent on the second syllable. And the other one is an insight, with the accent on the first syllable. So insight means to cause. I incited anger in the dog by poking him. 
And then insight means what we can see inside of something. He had good insight into our problem. He had good wisdom to speak into our problem. Okay, that's a quick definition. Carry on with your work.